Okay, it's uh, it's a pleasure to have Michael Small, who is uh, visiting, I think, for the first time here. And uh, uh, he's he's in the University of Western Australia. Uh, he works on complex systems and networks and so on. So he is going to talk to us about uh, ordinal networks. Uh, thank you. And um, first, let me thank the organizers. Um, this is my first time in India. Oh, my second attempt to come to India, I was coming to a previous conference and then never quite made it. Um, so my only regret is that I'm only here for a couple of days and then flying back. So hopefully next time I can stay a bit longer and see more of the country. But um, what I want to talk to you about is kind of, it's, it's nice following on from the two morning talks um, because there's not, I'm a mathematician, but there's not many theorems in this talk either, but there is some theory. Um, and I do a lot of work with engineers, so we're actually interested in applying this stuff for real practical purposes. So um, my job is actually split between um, working in the, the math school at my university and this other affiliation here, which is um, Australia's um, federal government funded industry research agency. So their, their remit is like industry-focused research and um, getting research outcomes that are useful, which is political speak for making people employed. So um, there's kind of a real, there's a real application to it. And the people that I'm working with are in the um, section called Mineral Resources. Uh, the reason for this is that um, if you look at a map of Australia, you've got Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, on one side, um, Adelaide down the bottom, and Perth over in Western Australia on the other third of the continent. Uh, we're the only city in that one third of the country, and most of the rest of the country is full of various minerals and stuff, which we have a habit of digging up out of the ground and selling to places like China, mostly. Um, we tend to dig up iron ore, sell it to China, and then buy it back in the shape of cars, and things that have much higher value attached to them. So um, the basic problem for them is how to find stuff in the ground, how to dig it up, and how to do that efficiently. So, uh, this is already falling asleep or something. Helps if I plug it in, I guess. It's all right, I think it's, yep. So let me start with um, the basics. We all know what a dynamical system is. I'm not gonna dwell on anything that's written up there. Um, except to say that very soon I'm going to confuse things um, by deliberately blurring uh, continuous dynamical systems and discrete dynamical systems. And the reason for that is that what I'm actually interested in is data from one of these systems. So the system is likely continuous, however we're measuring it at discrete regular time intervals. We've got some measurement function and we're measuring discrete iterates of a of discrete time version of the dynamics of that system. So all we see is the time series that comes out of that, the scalar output. And of course, we know what to do with this. Um, Tarkin's theorem has been about for a long time. We take an embedding lag and embedding dimension. Well, here I don't even do that. I'm just taking some dimension m, taking iterates of that state, so x is what I'm measuring at different times, measuring at time i, i plus 1, i plus m. That gives me a vector in here in m dimensions, and there's sufficient results to tell us that the sequence of these vectors, vi to vi plus 1, encapsulate everything we need to work out the dynamics of the system, up to suitable generic conditions. So typically the way this proceeds is that, I think it's on the next slide, yeah, typically we actually do this. So we've got some scalar observations, we estimate some optimal time lag tau, some optimal dimension m, we can estimate that by looking at autocorrelation, mutual information, um, guessing, applying a rule of thumb, and there's some correct embedding dimension m, which depends on the number of degrees of freedom of your system. And again, we can estimate that. But this has been about for a long time. Um, we want to do something different. 
What can we do beyond that? And since we're interested in dynamics and networks here, the big hint is how can we bring networks into this? What can we do to bring networks into the story? And that's where my story begins today. So um, I'm going to start by talking about recurrence networks. You've already seen this, um, so it gives me some leeway to go through that quickly. And then talk about why we're not doing recurrence networks, but we're doing something called ordinal networks. And finally, by the end of the talk, I will show you how we are beginning to use these ordinal networks to try to estimate the sort of transitions in dynamics that we heard about in the talk before the break. So the idea here is that I've got some system that I'm measuring over time, and it's going to... Well, we're interested in big machines that they're driving around the northwest of Western Australia to dig stuff out of the ground. Big yellow trucks. Um, which break down and they're expensive, so they want to know when to fix them. So we're going to measure the vibration on these things, and we want to know when to turn the machine off to place the bearings, oil it, change the tires, whatever they're going to do. Okay, so start with recurrence networks. Um, the motivation for this, of course, goes back all the way to Poincaré's recurrence theorem, and the key point of this, for those of you that aren't in dynamical systems and the theory end of things, is that if you've got a continuous dynamical system, knowing about when that system goes back to the same or almost the same state is useful. Knowing about the rate at which it goes back to different points in your state space tell you an awful lot, or everything, about the underlying dynamics. So this is actually the motivation for recurrence plots. So the idea with recurrence plots is that we build a matrix, label the components of that matrix 1 or 0, depending on whether those states of the system, which might as well be those embedded points VI, VJ that I spoke about earlier, if you have access to the full state, you don't need to do the embedding, you can just look at the difference between the states. When they get close, closer than some threshold, label it 1, otherwise it's 0. So basically here, VI, uh, RIJ, the RIJ is 1, if state i and state j are close together, and it's zero if they're not. So it gives you that recurrence structure, hence the name recurrence plot. Um, there's a tweak on this which I'm mentioning down here because most people, particularly most people from Potsdam, do this thing here. Um, but there's a different way to do it, which is actually what I did for some reasons, which please ask me about and I'll tell you about it later. But essentially, instead of taking a fixed threshold epsilon, what I'm doing is this is an indicator function, and I'm assigning 1 if state i and state j are amongst the k closest. So we're making state i close to its k closest neighbors. Rather than putting little balls everywhere with epsilon radius, and putting everything within those epsilon balls as close, I'm saying things are close if they're one of the k closest neighbors. Um, the distinction here is that, well, both, both schemes you've got a parameter that you've got to fiddle with. Ah, sorry, I, there's a parameter you have to tune. In the first case with the epsilon ball, though, that parameter is constant over state space. In the second scheme, essentially because you're fix, picking a fixed number of neighbors, if you've got regions of state space that are dense with points and regions which are sparse with points, this is essentially taking that and smoothing it out, performing some sort of diffeomorphic by construction transformation of that less dense and more dense state space into one which, with flat density. Okay, so there's two ways of doing it. You do this, you get pictures that look like this. Um, these are the different time series. These are the recurrence plots. So I11 one, one is there. N, N is up there, so you see the diagonal line there because state I is close to state I. You see the bands of off-diagonals because there's some periodicity in this. This happens to be the Rossler system transitioning from um, just past periodic to chaos and back to period something, period seven, I think, period six or something like that. I can't remember which one it is, but the key thing is that the recurrence plot 
shows you the dynamics. Now, we are interested in networks. The obvious way of turning that into a network is to stop treating it as a plot and treat it as an adjacency matrix. Right? And that's essentially what we saw earlier, and that's essentially all that we're doing here. So these are the networks, the four networks corresponding to these four plots. Right? The nodes, there's a lot of nodes because there's 2,000 points on both axes. So there's 2,000 nodes in each of these four graphs. So they're beyond the resolution of the projector to actually see them. What you see instead is just the links connecting those, those nodes. And again, you can see a transition from a periodic structure here at 0.411 the, to this chaotic structure here and the beginnings of chaos in this picture over here. And so the idea is maybe we can use the tools from graph theory to um, measure stuff on these graphs and have that tell us something about the dynamics, which we've only really measured, after all, through this experiment, through this observation. Okay? And so we do this with the standard um, toy dynamical systems, the Rossler system, that's the original x, y, z coordinates of the differential equations. Uh, the red dots are just a sampling of that. That's the time series of x, and that's the network we construct out of that. Okay? So the network, although I'm putting it in here on two dimensions and implying that it came from three dimensions, it's just an adjacency matrix. The embedding in a Euclidean space is an artifact of how I'm displaying it. Um, but you see this pinching here corresponding to the stretching and folding. Do the same thing with the Lorenz. So I should also mention that that's, it looks pretty, but it's also kind of a little bit underwhelming because this picture looks an awful lot like what you would get if you just took this and did a delay embedding to it. Right, so it's, the picture doesn't look all that much different from the sort of picture you would get out of doing Tarkin's embedding theorem a la mid-1980s. This is the same thing for the Lorenz system, original x, y, z coordinates, x component, and the network. So this time at least the network does look a little different. Um, part of this is an artifact of the way I'm choosing these neighbors, the K nearest neighbor versus the epsilon ball thing, because these two parts on the, the two lobes, those are the two wings. And this part here is actually the smaller region closer to the origin where trajectories are folding over from one side to the other. Right, so one arm is the path of trajectories from one side to that side, and that's the path of trajectories going back the other way. Okay, but Looks pretty at least, and that was what kind of piqued our curiosity. That's a similar picture for um, Chua's circuit, um, just to show you something else coming out here, something that looks a little different. What can we do to characterize this? Yep, my face is falling off, right? I'm trying, I'm trying to talk without moving my jaw so it wouldn't move any further. It wasn't working very well. Yeah? Okay. Um, looking at pictures is nice, but how can we go beyond just reading the tea leaves and looking at the pattern to actually measuring something? Um, what we first did uh, 10 years ago now is look at the frequency with which we see each of, in this case, the six subgraphs of four nodes. Right, so if you take four nodes on a network that are connected to one another, they can be connected up to um, permutation of the nodes in one of six different ways. And it turns out that irrespective of what data I use to generate the system, that's the most frequent one, which is not terribly surprising. Probably has something to do with the sampling rate rather than anything else, because it's just a piece of trajectory. Um, the other ones occur at different rates. You can see that some of these symbols, some of these locations in here, and that is a direct result of the nature of the underlying dynamics. Um, again, I, well, maybe I'll just draw one little picture. Um, it depends on the um, dimension of your system. So if I've got three nodes, which are nodes from an embedding, so they're in a Euclidean space, and I say this node is close to that one and close to that one, 
Now, if I want to have a fourth node that is also close to this one, it has to either be... So if I want to put a fourth node here, if I put it out here, it can be close to that one, but not close to those two. But if I want to stick with uh, just one dimension, then this node would have to be down here somewhere. All right, so if I've got four nodes in one dimension, locally in 1D, then you're going to see this sort of structure. All right, that one is connected in a triangle, and you've got one hanging off the edge. Only in 2D can you see that structure. Because only then is there enough space to spread the nodes out. Which is why you see these different things, this one here in particular, and this one here, occurring at different rates, depending on the local dimension of the system which generated the data, which generated the network. Okay, that's all kind of neat. Um, there's schemes which I won't talk about unless someone asks me um, to go backwards so we can prove this process is invertible. I can take the, yeah. Why use four? Um, there's one very good reason to only use four. Yeah. Um, so the question is, why do we have just motifs of size four rather than size three or size five? Yeah. Um, that's right, right? That's right. If it's size three, then it's boring. There's only one or they're either all connected or they're just, there's only two ways of doing that. If it's five, there's too many um, because it's computationally expensive to identify all the subgraphs of size five in this network. If I've got a few thousand nodes in the graph, identifying subgraphs of size bigger than four and then classifying them takes a long time. We can do it, we have done it, um, but it's a long, slow process for no extra benefit, at least that we know about. Um, if there's an eager PhD student that's good at coding and graph topology and wants to pick it up and do this, they can probably find more than we did. But um, we did four because we could. I was wondering if there is any yep. topological underlying uh, reasons. Huh? It was sufficient to have four because you can then get these um, features like this that you're going to see in two dimensions but not three dimensions. In five, you'll get much richer stuff going on as well. Um, by the time you get to size five, my suspicion is you actually want to start looking at other structures in the graphs, either cycles or k cores or other more sort of local properties that might be properties of things like um, close transit to unstable periodic orbits or this sort of more detailed structure. Um, in truth, choosing motifs of size 4 is a very simple thing to do, and the properties that we get out on the, right, on the left here are actually fairly simple properties um, that provide a nice classification. Yeah. Any other questions on that before I throw this away and do something do something else? Okay, so um, there are results that we have um, mostly or borrowing work that Yoshito and uh, Kazuo Ihara in 2008 recurrence networks. Uh, Alex Cora and I did the same thing for these um, space-based networks and showed that you could start with the Tarkins embedding produce a network, which I'm not showing here, and then get back from the network alone with time information, something which is near enough to what you started with. All right, so I'm saying that's the same as that, and that's the same as that. Um, there's some technicalities there, but we have this sufficiency of information to invert the transformation, which is what we're after. Okay, do all of that, but... Um, a couple of weaknesses to this approach, and one of them is connected to the question of measuring these motifs. Um, if I've got lots of data, each embedded point is a node on my network. If I have more data, I get bigger networks, bigger, bigger, bigger networks. Um, we all like big networks, 
And there's plenty of papers in FISREV letters and FISREV E where people looked at really big networks of co-publication and all sorts of things like that. But here, having a big network is not necessarily better. We would like to have a smaller network but have statistically better estimates of where the links are in that network. Right? So what we're thinking about here is now changing pace and not linking the nodes on the network to points in state space, but linking the nodes on the network to areas in state space, to regions. And so every time your trajectory visits that region again, the network is revisiting the same node, and you're seeing new transitions between regions, which are new transitions between nodes, which is giving you additional certainty on those transition probabilities, which essentially boils down to a Markov chain, which I'll get to in a moment. But the motivation for this is something called forbidden sequences. So there's many ways in which you can um, partition up your state space into little chunks and measure transition between them. Um, forbidden sequences is nice for two reasons. One, it's uh, robust to noise. And two, at least for simpler systems, you can see how it immediately um, captures underlying features of the dynamics. Okay, so let me show you what I mean. That's a straight line. It's the identity line. That is the logistic map. All right, so the simple logistic map, that's the logistic map squared. Apologies, green's not coming out very well, but you can all imagine where that line is. That's the logistic map cubed, and I don't think there's another one. No, there's not. So that's the y equals x, f of x, f squared of x, and f cubed of x in blue. And how do we connect this to regions of state space? Well, we look at the ordering of x, f of x, f squared, and f cubed. Which one's bigger? All right, so we then have, if you're in this region here, for example, you have a particular ordering. x is the smallest. Then f squared is the next smallest. f of x is the next smallest. And f cubed is the largest. Sorry, by f squared and f cubed, I mean f of f of x and f of f of f of x. Okay. So for different regions in my state, after all, the logistic map is just one dimension, I'm going to have different encodings based on these orderings of successive points. What's more, we can measure, I'm still there, we can measure, so these are the different codings, 4, 3, 2, 1, just meaning if I'm between 0 and 0 0.6 of so this first region here, um, the largest thing is f cubed, the second largest thing is f squared, then f of x, then x. That's what that 4321 means. There's a couple of different ways of symbolizing that. Um, they're equivalent, of course. I won't bother with the details. But that particular symbol corresponds to that particular region. And in fact, we know what the invariant density of that is from the fact that many people smarter than I have have looked at the logistic map for much longer than I have. But we can also estimate this density by observing how often we fall into that region. The longer we see our orbit, the better that estimate's going to be. Um, in fact, some of the symbols occur, the same symbol occurs in two different intervals of this map. And so you see immediately, because there's only 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 of these things, that some codes are not occurring at all. This is where the forbidden part of the forbidden sequences comes from. Certain sequences of these iterates will not occur unless due to noise, if it's, a deter if it's this deterministic system. OK, so we can now build a network from all of this in the obvious way. These are our nodes. The links are nodes that are connected if you transition from one state to the other. And we can even add in link weight, the density, based on how often you see that particular transition. We can have node weight based on how often you see those states. So now we're building up a, a network which has a lot more information that's going to get better and better the longer we observe the system. So what does this look like? Well, same 
same picture for what I've just described. Here's my time series. These are my little intervals. I map them to particular orders of the points, which map to nodes on the network that are connected if that symbol, 4213, is then followed by 4123, then those two nodes are linked. And the weight can depend on how often that happens. Um, so there's the sequel to your question about the size of the subgraphs, which is how do you choose the size of the window here? Um, the answer is entirely different, actually. The longer the window, the better, because you're getting a finer and finer partition of state space. However, as you get a longer and longer window, the number of possible sequences goes up very quickly, W factorial, in fact. And my ears are obviously too big or too small or in the wrong place. Um, and so although you would like to have as long as possible, you can't have too long because you're going to run out of data. So here, the window size is actually a pragmatic balance between how much data you've got and how much information you want to get out of your system. Um, that's just the same picture again. Uh, this is just a bit of symbols. If you want to, you can think about this state. Z0 is where you are now. This is the dynamics of your dynamical system applied in backwards time and then in forward time. So you get the sequence of applications of that. And each of these points in that sequence corresponds to a particular symbol from my set of possible symbols. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the symbols that I've chosen and the, where I am at that time in K. And the weights on my network are essentially the measure associated with transitions between the corresponding two regions of state space, okay. which is nice because that gives us an in into estimating things like lap and exponents and entropy. Okay, um, I won't dwell on all the symbols there because I don't have time to, but essentially my labels that I've attached to regions of state space, they correspond to um, the, the regions and the symbols, and my points are within one of those regions at each time, point in time. Um, we can estimate, and this is again not nothing that we've that I, that my group has done. This is stuff that the people that were looking at these forbidden sequences have done, and other people before them. Um, different versions of entropy, permutation entropy, based on the probability of us seeing each of these symbols. So that's just a node probability. Conditional permutation entropy, where you're looking at um, Transitions between pairs of these symbols. If you're in one, how do you get to another? So probably a bigger, given you're in one, and you go to another one. So you've got the um, states xi and pi following one after another. The interesting one is the topological entropy, which is related to the um, maximum eigenvalue of the adjacency matrix, transition matrix that we build from this process. The sort of pictures we get out of this, um, this is just for different size periodic orbits. Right? So it's not quite as neat as what I showed you before. It's not just a nice clean circle. Um, this is because, because I'm sampling. I'm sampling a continuous system. And so I might see different transitions. I might jump over different transitions. If you think about... Um, Essentially, if I've got something which is smoothish, and I'm looking at sequences of symbols, of points, I'm going to see stuff like that quite often as I'm going up. Right? That's going to map onto the same symbol, one, two, three, four. And the next one, if it's those four points versus those four points, it's the same symbol. And then as you go over the top, you're going to see various different ordered or structured permutations of that. So there's still a lot of structure in the periodic cases to get a handle on 
the non-periodic behavior in that, you need to get a longer window so that you can go over multiple segments there. Um, and what we can, in fact, do is, well, we can dream up several different quantities. The one that I'm showing you here is related to the logarithm of the null space of the transition matrix. That's the red line. And I'm computing this quantity for this transition matrix that I've estimated from different time series generated from different systems, where each of those different systems is just the logistic map with a different value of the bifurcation parameter. And that's the bifurcation diagram. So as I go through that bifurcation diagram, this quantity goes up quite a lot like what the Lapinov exponent does. Um, other 1D maps, you get the same sort of strong hint that this quantity is changing in exactly the same way, or near enough to exactly the same way as the Lapinov exponent is. The key, though, is that it's not an absolute measure of divergence of nearby trajectories. Right? It only makes sense because I'm plotting it here and comparing different values. If I just gave you the number, it would mean nothing in isolation. It's only a relative score that's relatively changing in the same way that Lapinov exponent does. There's no inherent time scale there. Um, if you do push the theory a little bit further, and again, um, I will defer that to questions or um, Gary's paper back in last millennia. If you look at these regions and transitions between them and measure the size of those things, that's what gives me my transition weight, Pij, normalized by these things here. Uh, well, it says they're the right eigenvectors of the largest non-negative eigenvalue of the transpose of the transition matrix. What that means is that they are the relative populations of, the, of how, often, how much time you spend in each node. So you're looking at the relative transitions weighted by how often you're actually in those things to start with. And this then gives us something computable which we can actually get to converge, at least for simple enough systems, to the largest Lapinov exponent. OK, good. That's nice, but only works for systems like this, which are pretty well understood anyway. I mean, we want our theory to work for the logistic map, but I can estimate the logistic map pretty well from 10 data points, because it's just quadratic. It doesn't take much observation to get a good estimate of that map. We want something that's going to work in more complicated situations. Well, those are the same simple situations and even simpler one-hump maps. So in those simple one-hump maps, it does a good job. But I want to now shift gears again and say, what if I apply these same ideas, which we've only really shown to work in either the standard differential equations of chaotic systems integrated for a long, integrated for a long enough time, or our usual maps of choice? What about data? Yeah, you want to ask a question? This one, or? Legends. OK, so these are different values of entropy that I'm computing. The black thing is an estimate of the maximum Lapinov exponent using this expression here, which comes from estimating transitions between these ordinal regions. So essentially, I'm taking the time series, building a Markov transition matrix from the ordinal transition regions using those transition rates to estimate the Lapinov exponent and comparing that with the true theoretical value as I increase the window size. Right, so as I increase the resolution. So in a land where I've got infinite data and I can increase the resolution as much as I like and I'm only after all looking at a 1D map, I can use this to get a pretty good estimate of the Lapinov exponent. Theoretical line in red corresponds to. Uh... Um, so that so in the logistic map and the shift map that is theoretical. That's analytically computable. We know the invariant density. We know the map. We can compute the Lapinov exponent. The cubic map. I'm not sure what is analytic approximation rather than theoretical. <laughs> Maybe someone else can tell me why that one's harder to compute. I don't remember. Tent map again. It's entirely theoretical. But just log of the slope of the map. Which one, uh, the x-axis is the window size, the resolution of the, of the ordinal sequence. So as m is increasing, I'm taking a larger window of points. Um, and as m goes up, my 
it saturates to the thing, and what happens is taking a bigger M doesn't give you more information. You're getting M factorial possible symbols, less the forbidden ones, but at some point there's no more information in that. Because after all, I stuck with a 1D map. Sorry, I might have missed this window size. Do you mean to say that? Sorry, um, that's uh, M is the, if I skip all the way back, M is this window here. Uh, I took four here as the example, so taking sequences of four points, but obviously it can take longer. If I'm going to be looking at flows rather than yeah, discrete okay. maps, then it has to be bigger again. Um, with flows, of course, it doesn't grow quite so rapidly, so there's, there's that benefit. So the maximum window size is 20. Yeah, so somewhere then we got bored, yeah. Um, you could, yes. Yeah. You could, in principle, um, if you're going to wait long enough. Yeah. Okay, so that's the, the toy systems, the usual toy systems. So the last couple of minutes, um, let me move to just a couple of examples to convince you or motivate in you that these ideas not only work for these simple systems, but potentially work in real-world data as well. Um, so these are ECGs. Um, this is ECG of either people, so these are all sick people. These are people from the coronary care unit in the hospital. They've all either just had heart surgery or had a heart attack and about to undergo heart surgery or some other major cardiac event. Um, the purple ones though, so the X and what, so the Y axis is that window size again. The X axis, sorry, the X axis is the window size. The Y axis is, is not Lyapunov exponent now, it's just entropy. Entropy has its own time scale. It's got the sampling, a sampling rate in here, which is the distance between them, between these points now. That's a parameter I haven't been playing with up until now. Um, turns out on the next slide I need that. But it's a measure of entropy at some time scale as I increase the window size for these people with cardiac events. When they have a normal heart rhythm, when they have ventricular tachycardia and when they have ventricular fibrillation. So very briefly, tachycardia is rapid heart flutter, fibrillation is full-blown heart attack, cardiac arrest. And tachycardia will often precede fibrillation. So not terribly impressive and in fact kind of disappointing in fact. It seemed to be all over the place and not telling us anything. The kicker is if I then take this quantity and plot it against this quantity. The difference between these two quantities is different time scale. So I'm measuring entropy as a function of time scale in my segment, a long and short time scale. That's what this looks like. Right, so with these two different time scales coming into play and now fixing M, I get not perfect, but much better separation. Um, I stress this is, this is actually in a hospital. This is a coronary care unit. This is data that I collected using the hospital system, which is only designed to measure heart rate and sound alarms. It's not research quality. It's a 10-bit AD converter, which has not been optimally tuned and may only have eight bits of resolution anyway. Um, and these people are sick. Their normal rhythms and their abnormal rhythms are normal for them, but they have a large variation and are not what I hope any of you are experiencing. So the fact that we can get anything out of there is actually kind of encouraging. Um, application two, um, this is the same, same thing again. Entropy, this is now RR intervals of ECG, so just time between peaks. So the duration of heartbeats. The two populations, one population is young, one population is old. Old here is defined as 42 plus, sorry. I'm in that group too. Um, for those of you that aren't, it'll come. And what they've done, this is just data I got off PhysioNet, it's not my own experiment this time. Um, put people in a quiet room, measure their RR intervals whilst they're watching Fantasia, the Mickey Mouse Disney movie Fantasia, hence Mickey Mouse. So does anyone know what Fantasia is? Well, you miss, you're missing out. Um, it's 1960s, I guess. 
I need to check, but it was a Walt Disney movie where um, Mickey Mouse goes and experiences this adventure, all set to various pieces of classical music. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. Anyway, yeah, okay, someone does. Yeah. Um, and it was intended at the time as kind of young persons into classical music. And so surprisingly, these two groups, there is separate... There's, okay, there's a couple of old people here that are behaving like they're young people, but um, apart from them, the two groups are different, if not separable, just from the simple measures. Oh, time's up. I want to just skip forward to the very last thing, and that is what I've been showing you so far is comparing state A and state B applying the measures to state A and state B and trying to see if state B is different from state A. If we go back to the original problem, either something like thermoacoustic, whatever it's called, uh, the, the flaming stuff, yeah, um, to either that or my problem, which is machine um, chatter and noises in machines indicating they're about to go bang, we actually have a gradual transition. And we don't want to actually know when the thing's gone bang because it's too late. You want to detect the tipping point before you're at the tipping point. Okay, so the first thing I've done here is, well, I've not done exactly that, but I've taken the Lorenz system. I've very slightly changed one of the bifurcation parameters. And the red and the green points are with the two different values. Don't ask me which one is which, doesn't matter. The first half of this is the first value, the second half is the second value, and I'm computing the rate of occurrence of these forbidden sequences, and as my window starts to move into the second half, that rate starts to climb. Okay, so this is still state A versus state B, and I can see the difference very slightly um, as I add noise. What I'm working on now is if we do the same thing when we are approaching some sort of tipping point where the dynamics are subtly changing prior to that change in the growth state. Um, I think I'll stop there rather than add any more. Um, give you a screen full of references, which won't be too much use, unless anyone wants to see it later on. Um, that's basically all the papers that contributed to this. And acknowledge um, the two PhD students who both finished their PhDs on this topic. Alex, who did a substantial part of work on this, uh, my colleagues at UWA have also contributed to this and other people elsewhere. Thank you for your attention. And that's a bit bright, so I'll skip back to that one. Uh, yeah. I have a question with this ECG uh, data. So, yeah. This one? So here, yes, uh, I understand the, the window size where you represent at least by four nodes or it can go up to 20. Uh, I, I don't clearly get how you can have time scales less than the window size. So this is, um, so, you, so I, your, the microphone's dropped out, so let me just repeat the question to make sure I Actually, uh, in the next plot, in the next page, you have a time scale which is less than the window size. So your sampling, it's kind of in the uh, axis. You mean, you mean these things X here? Axis, yeah. So my sampling rate is bounded by one because it's, this is now RR intervals. So they are successive heartbeats. So what I'm saying here is I'm taking seven successive heartbeats and using the time interval, eight successive heartbeats and the time intervals between them as my seven data points for that code word. That's a break between... Uh, yep. And so what I'm doing here is not taking six, seven successive heartbeats, but taking a, a gap of 10. Right? So I take the time interval between two heartbeats, then 10 later, the time interval between those two, and then 10 later, the time interval between those two, yeah. and so on. So your resting heart rate's, what, 60, 70 beats per minute? So this is about 10 seconds. That's about a minute total window time. So, so I'm wondering, how is this recipe arrived at? Like, how do you determine this? By getting a PhD student and then punching them until they do it. Um, yeah, so there's, a, there are the, the, there's some detail in the, um, 
in arriving at this recipe, choosing these numbers, the fact that I'm showing you one set of numbers, not all the other sets of numbers, um, and of course then there's a multiple comparison problem, the statistics behind that. Um, these are, it's not that I've just kicked the PhD student until he got one picture that looked right. Um, the only thing you need to do is have two separate timescales that are separated by about an order of magnitude, and then the pictures look the same. Is there a, you know, that embedding time delay, does it come into picture like you, that does kind of a way of So, um, M is actually chosen in much the same way as you choose embedding dimension in a delay embedding. Tau is then set at the minimum. We've got to use one. And we want to use another time scale. We essentially just add an order of magnitude to that. And that's, that's it. Um, I'm trying to convey that the yellow dots and the blue triangles are different. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a horrible, messy data set. And it is just resting heart rates of people watching a movie. Um, there's lots of reasons why older people, their heart rhythm is different from younger people. Um, a lot of them are completely unrelated to what you're watching at the time. Um, all I'm trying to do is show that these simple measures, which we've just been playing with on um, nice, clean toy system, have some discriminating power in these more complex systems. It's not certainly something which I'm advocating people could use to um, clinically diagnose anything here. It's simply a test of are these things different or not. Does that answer your question? Or I think probably you're asking something else. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, so, um, so there's two stories. One story is that um, although the documentation for the original paper put 42 as the number. One group was in their late 20s, early 30s. One group was typically 50 plus. Uh, so there was a separation between them. And of course, if you're in your 20s or 30s or if you're in your 50s or 60s, then your heart may be doing slightly different things, even if you're not watching Fantasia. So Fantasia is just a background to get people react, to be calm. Um, the authors of the original study, and I don't necessarily believe this, were trying to push that a bit further and say that people who were brought up in the age of Disney movies and classical music respond different to this familiar thing to younger people who aren't. But I think that's a discussion for um, over lunch or something. This problem of non-stationarity of your uh, time series, I mean, that would, um, um, would that limit your window? Or, I mean, that's a real issue with the uh, data. Right? Yes, yeah. So, there's, so the, when you get down to the experimental data here, there's two things. Thank you for asking this, because I was going to say this, but forgot. Um, there's two things that matter a lot. One is, of course, observational noise. You've always got measurement error. Um, these data, as I said, they were collected at about 8-bit resolution. Um, what's that, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 256 different values at most. That's not very good. Um, but it's also non-stationary. Right? You're measuring electrical potential. The person rolls over, it changes. All sorts of stuff happens. However, if you are measuring the relative magnitude of these points over a short segment, shorter than the stationarity, then simple drift is not going to affect that coding. So it's robust to certain sorts of contamination, and these include that typical type of um, baseline drift, non-stationarity, and also observational noise. Because I'm just looking at the relative size of these things, only in cases where the observation noise is causing that order to change am I going to end up with a misclassification. Right, so if the noise is smaller than that, then it has no effect on the outcome. So it gives, it's nice because it has a certain robustness up to a certain level for experimental data. Is that what you're asking about? Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Uh, 
for me, uh, which interval you use to plot this um, diagram? Uh, which interval from P, Q, R, S, T? Oh, okay. Exactly. Um, so this is the waveform. It's not, it's not the R, it's not just the peak of the R wave, it's the entire waveform. From P to P, for example? No, no. Or from okay, there's, there's, there's two separate sets of data. This set of data is taking the ECG waveform and just sampling that at regular time. And this is then every 20 or two, so I think sampling rate is 200 or 500 hertz. Mm -hmm. And so this is every 20 sample in that constant sampling rate. The second picture, the RR interval one, is a different data set where now I'm looking at R intervals and the time between them. This is clear, but yeah. previous one, it's not so. <laughs> so this one is just, it's just a time series. It's a um, constant sampling rate over the entire ECG waveform. So it's encoding all of the, the whole PQRS waveform. Okay. Okay. That, that but it's, uh, I, I really not sure about the, the, the value. What is different? If you uh, take RR or PP, it would be. So, so maybe we can discuss it over okay. the Other questions? Thank you. Okay, I'll talk to, I'll try and explain that. Other questions? No, everyone wants lunch. Okay, time for lunch. Let's thank <laughs> to Michael again. Yeah.